welcome back for another Naval History edition of the Proceedings Podcast presented by the U.S. Naval Institute. You don't want to miss the Naval Institute's upcoming conference, Securing the Nation, Energy Security, Fortifying the Defense Industrial Base, and Strengthening Infrastructure Resilience on 17 October at our Jack C. Taylor Conference Center here in Annapolis, Maryland, USA. Visit usni.org slash events to register now for this hybrid event. And for more information on all of our esteemed speakers that will be there, space is limited, so sooner the better on that. Well, today we're going to hop in the Wayback Machine back to July and August of 1943. In July of 1943, the Allies launched Operation Husky, the invasion of Sicily. It was quite a signal victory for the Allied forces as um, General Patton, Lieutenant General Patton and General Montgomery of the British armies spearheaded two marches north and east across Sicily and conquered it quite handily. Um, it was a glorious victory, really, but by August of 1943, the glorious victory had been soured by what the Axis powers themselves dubbed as a glorious retreat, a fantastically organized amphibious withdrawal of major divisions of Axis forces that the Allied troops would be forced to fight again because they lived to fight another day and weren't contained and neutralized while we had them on Sicily. There are a lot of lessons to be learned from this, and it's darn fascinating anyway, lessons or not. So here to tell us about it and expound on his wonderful article in the current issue of Naval History Magazine is Marine Lieutenant Colonel Brian Kerr. Brian, thank you for joining us. Good morning from beautiful San Diego. I'm very happy to be here. Great Navy town. All right. Well, um, Brian is very prolific, and we'll talk about that some too, but let's get right down to the meat of the matter. Um, the invasion of Sicily, all important prior to the invasion of Italy and then onward mainland of Europe. So this is an important stepping stone. And it's one of those great historical examples of how it's a very great victory, but the enemy gets away when the, if things have been handled better, they shouldn't have. Um, it's kind of like uh, the first battle bull run on steroids, how the uh, other, other retreating side actually gets away because the victor doesn't have enough follow through in the end of it all. So um, why don't you um, talk us all through this, Brian, and um, we'll be showing images from your article as well. And for those who have read it, this will help flesh it out for you. And if you haven't, this should inspire you to do so. So let's go back to July 1943 and the situation in Sicily. All right, Eric. Hey, thank you so very much. That's a great setup. So uh, the article I wrote it exam examined Operation Lairgang, or the Axis withdrawal across the Strait of Messina. Uh, as you noted, it took place at the end of Operation Husky, or the Allied Invasion of Sicily. And the Axis forces are put in an untenable position, and they're forced to conduct that amphibious withdrawal. The article, it focused on that retreat primarily from the Axis perspective and examined the Axis employment of command and control, joint warfighting, and some innovations that enabled their retreat. The article also examined some missed opportunities on the part of the Allies. So while, as you noted, Operation Husky was absolutely an Allied victory, the Axis also pulled off a virtuosic retreat under military pressure, forcing the Allies to fight the same German divisions as slipped away for the arrest of the Italian campaign in a years-long attritional slugfest. Finally, the article discusses the contributions of two leaders who were key to the actual conduct of the cross-strait withdrawal, Frigate Captain Gustav von Liebenstein and Colonel Ernst Gunther Bade as the Commandant of the Strait of Messina. So if I may, let's expand our view a bit, uh, and I'll briefly summarize Husky, and that's going to set the stage for the Axis retreat. The Allies initiated Operation Husky, the invasion of Sicily, on the evening of 9 July 1943. These amphibious landings, they exceed all expectations. Despite the Axis anticipating the assault, they saw it coming. The Allies rapidly build combat power ashore. U.S. General George Patton's 7th Army and British General Bernard Montgomery's 8th Army make steady progress north and east, advancing toward Messina. Located at the northeast end of Sicily, Messina offered the only suitable ferry routes by which to cross from Sicily to Italy. So if Messina fell, so too would Sicily, along with the forces that remained on it. So the Allies, they drive across the island while maintaining air and sea superiority throughout the campaign. 
Axis planners, they fear that the Allies might conduct another landing on Calabria, that is the toe on the boot of Italy across from Sicily. If the Allies did this, they would have bottled up the Axis forces on Sicily, and German planners feared that the bulk of their forces on Sicily would be lost. So let's talk about the actual decision to evacuate. Hitler, he waffles back and forth, and he's hoping his forces are going to miraculously rout the Allies against all odds and win back Sicily. Not the first time he does this, not the last. But it was clear to Field Marshal Albert Kesselring that an evacuation is necessary to save his forces and preserve them for better employment on the Italian peninsula later in the fight. So to get ahead of the Allied threat, Kesselring, he directs the German and the Italian troops to conduct that amphibious evacuation under military pressure, so fighting withdrawal, which they call Operation Lairdam. General Hans Hude, the commander of the 14th Panzer Corps, and Italian General Alfredo Guzzoni, commander of the Italian 6th Army, are given the order by Kesselring, and they start the evacuation before it's approved by Hitler. Now, this is a decision made at great risk to himself, but in Kesselring's view, there was no other choice, so he gambled, he took the risk. And that audacity bought precious time that was essential to the success of the Axis withdrawal. So the Italian 6th Army, they begin their evacuation on 9 August, while the 14th Panzer Corps start on 10 August. And each night, Kesselring plans to transport several thousand troops across the strait and then have Axis forces fall back to the next line of resistance on Sicily. To do this, Kesselring established an all-German transport service to ferry troops and materiel between Sicily and Calabria and appointed as its commander a German naval officer, Frigate Captain Gustav von Liebenstein. So let's talk about him for a little bit. He was a naval officer, and he had last served prior to World War II and World War I. He'd seen action on a torpedo boat during the Battle of Jutland, and before the end of that war, he rose to command his own motor torpedo boat. At the end of the war, he is discharged, but he remains in the reserves, and there he remains for about 20 years until World War II kicks off. So that's quite a break in active service, and he is recalled to active duty in 1940. And two years later, he's commanding a minesweeping flotilla operating in the North Sea, and then later is transferred to Italy to command the second landing flotilla and then the second naval landing division. So this is a guy with a small boats background. He's got minesweeping experience and amphibious experience, exactly the kind of expertise the Axis are going to need withdrawing from Sicily. As Operation Husky approaches, Von Liebenstein, he's appointed as sea transport leader of the Messina Strait. This put him in command of all sea port transportation moving German forces across the strait. This is noted in the article, but let me unpack that a bit more here. Before the invasion, while Von Liebenstein is at Sicily, he bore witness to the Allied bombing of the harbor areas and the ferry routes used during peacetime. So this forced the Germans to shift to new ferry routes, but this adaptation yielded a, a chaotic and a disjointed command structure. So the Luftwaffe, the German Navy, and the German Army, they each controlled their own ferries and their own ferry service, operating independently of each other, and generally disregarded the requirements of their sister services. So they're just stepping on top of each other, and it's horribly inefficient. So unity of command and unity of effort did not exist on the strait. And so the throughput of the troops and material is poor. And this is what's informing some of the estimates of the German planners that this is going to be a disaster. Look how few people we can move at any time. We're going to lose a lot on Sicily. Von Liebenstein, as the sea transport leader, he quickly remedies this. While German army planners, again, they're initially pessimistic about the chances of evacuating um, and still thinking that most of their forces are going to be lost, uh, Von Liebenstein, he has profound confidence in their odds, and he tells Hube that with his changes, he could ferry over 12,000 men and their equipment each day. So Von Liebenstein, he wastes no time in using his new authority to make critical changes. He reorganized the Army, Air Force, and the Navy flotillas, which again had been competing for the same resources through separate lines of command control, makes a single ferry service under his control, and he drastically increases throughput. He directs the construction of more efficient docking facilities and road networks connecting to the docks. He implements one of the first roll-on, roll-off schemes for the loading and unloading of cargo, whereas this process could previously take over an hour. It can now be done in just 20 minutes. 
And finally, he raised the number of primary German ferry routes from three to five, while also changing the embarkation and landing sites on each side of the strait to confound Allied bombing. So daily capacity of throughput for men and material at the docks raises tenfold. So now while on Liebstein, he's employed every vessel that was available to him, two particular crafts stood out as essential to his flotilla of ferries. One was, and forgive me, uh, my German is terrible, uh, the Marine Fachkrama, the uh, ac- um, FMP is how it's acronymized, or the Naval Ferry Barge. So this is a flat bottom barge with three diesel engines that could cruise at eight knots, to carry 80 to 100 tons, and have the space to move up to five trucks or three tanks. But the other more innovative workhorse for the evacuation was the Seibel Ferry. This makeshift craft it joins two pontoons with steel girders, and then it laid a platform over the, gor- the girders to form a deck. One aircraft engine is attached to each of the two pontoons, allowing it to cruise at eight knots, and it can carry up to 60 tons and move up to 12 vehicles or 250 troops. Finally, to provide additional defense, on Liebenstein, he converts some of those Seibel Ferries into flagships, installing either two 105 millimeter anti-aircraft guns or three 88 millimeter anti-aircraft guns. Now the effect of these changes to surface transportation across the strait is game changing for the Axis. Arriving in late June, the Hermann Goring division is able to move over 600 vehicles, 700 tons of supply and 3,600 men across the strait in one day. That is from Calabria to Messina onto Sicily. And this is another important point. The withdrawal isn't just about the withdrawal. It also required reinforcement. Because of the relative combat power of the Allies that they had after they landed on Sicily, the Axis, they need more in order to have a controlled fighting withdrawal. So they need more combat power. They have to put more of their own forces across the strait first to enable a viable fighting retreat. So paradoxically, to enable a retreat, they had to, in effect, attack across from Cambria into Sicily, um, where they were actually trying to get away from. Only then could the Axis have the combat power to conduct that fighting withdrawal. And without von Liebenstein's reforms, it is unlikely that the Axis would have been able to position the needed combat power on Sicily in time to slow the Allied advance. Similar throughput supports the Axis through the rest of the Sicilian campaign, posturing them to commit a coordinated fighting withdrawal and then methodically retreat across the strait during Operation Lairgan. Um, we're going to move next to talk about the commandant of the straits. But before I go on, uh, Eric, any thoughts or, or comments on anything I just discussed? Well, a couple of things jumped out at me that jumped out at me when I read your article. How sort of the the hero of all this, really, for the Axis side was Field Marshal Castle Ring, because that took real um, chutzpah to proceed with this without asking for permission from their Fuhrer. But if he had asked permission, um, Hitler had a sort of penchant for like not ever wanting to give any ground. And he would leave troops in untenable positions to say, don't give up and don't retreat. Don't. And t- to he realized, I'd rather ask forgiveness than permission. It might mean my head, but it's going to save these guys. And, um, as you point out, the timing was crucial. If he had waited for permission from Hitler, um, none of this would have played out like it, it did. Um, and another thing, you might bring this up in a few, but um, we're going to, I'm sure we're going to talk about allied mistakes. But before we do that, well, one of them that intrigued me was if the allies had simply just bombed Calabria on the receiving end of the evacuation on the boot tip of Italy, if they had bombed that, they would have trapped the Axis forces on Sicily. Yet they had agreed months earlier, as you note, um, not to bomb Calabria at the Casablanca conference. And um, this was, in a sense, a big mistake in terms of those uh, forces getting loose to fight again. Um, maybe just talk about some of the reasoning that went behind not bombing it, really, uh, Calabria. Uh, was it of logistical importance when they invade Italy, or uh, what was the thought behind that? So there's two pieces, and I'm not sure I'll be able to answer with the precision you're seeking, but but I'll I'll, I'll speak to the two things I do know. So first, the, the decision at the Casablanca conference was made not to also invade on the main Italian peninsula. It was, hey, we're going to land on Sicily, 
And then we're going to focus on France before we worry about the rest of the Italian peninsula. And as the war developed, other decisions were made. But there were no forces allocated, and the decision had already been made not to apportion the forces to do a follow-on or simultaneous landing on Calabria. The Germans were very worried that this was a real possibility. Uh, they were very, very concerned about it, but they did not know that the Allies had already ruled that out and were uh, allocating the forces elsewhere for, uh, for Normandy. As far as the bombing itself, I can't speak to Calabria specifically, but I can speak to is the rest of the vicinities around there, all the other big major urban centers, road networks, et cetera. And that would have required the allocation of strategic bombing forces. And the, the, the folks that, of course, control those strategic bombing forces saw this as far too tactical. Uh, they wanted to go deeper and destroy the other targets that, that was would destroy the German war machine writ large. Uh, so they would have fought that uh, even if, if that request had been made. Um, as far as the nuances of Calabria specifically or how that request may have actually gone down and, and got shot down, that I can't speak to. But I do know that the, the powers that were and the forces in play probably would have nixed that. Yeah, it sounds like they had um, other priorities, air priorities. Um, and didn't see the forest for the trees or whatever. But um, another thing I'd point, I'd uh, ask about is um, you mentioned a lot of the key um, reasons for their success. You also described the importance of the flat guns and like uh, protecting the uh, flank of the um, evacuating uh, forces. Uh, they were a key part of it too. I think there were Luftwaffe flat guns that they uh, used for the evacuation. Oh yes, uh, and, and in fact, uh, let me let me drive forward and talk about the commandant of the Straits and the efforts that were made to defend uh, against air bombing of the evacuation itself, because there were flat guns, I believe, of all the services controlled by a single person. So we're going to see this theme once again of establishing unity of command, controlling uh, singularly coordinated sectors of fire or sectors of flak, if if you will if you'll permit me to use that term, um, and massing all those fires to keep uh, tactical Allied aircraft from being able to successfully bomb the evacuating forces. Mm -hmm. So the efforts to consolidate command and control of those forces, uh, they're reinforced by doing the same for the ground forces on the landward side of the evacuation. So four days after the start of Husky, Kesslering appoints Colonel Ernst Gunther Bade as the Commandant of the Straits of Messina, which is, I mean, that's a pretty cool title. Come on. Um, so we have to take a second to talk about Bade, because when you read about some of his exploits, you would not be blamed for thinking he's, he's a bit of a cartoon character. So he joins the German army in 1914. He fights in World War I, during which time he's awarded the Iron Cross. And after World War I, he, like von Liebenstein, he has a huge break in service. Then he's joined to the active reserve of officers in 1942. And very quickly, he rises to regimental command, leading the 115th Rifle Regiment in the 15th Panzer Division in North Africa. And this is where Bade comes into his own. All right, so we get this. While with the Africa Corps, he would go into battle carrying a Claymore sword and wearing a Scottish kilt. Uh, he was an oddball, but, but he was a brave oddball. As a general, he kept a small staff and he visited the troops at the front regularly. And despite his eccentricities, he is popular with the troops. Uh, one example of his boldness is seen in a, uh, a very unique award. He is recipient of, among other honors, the Tank Destruction Badge, which, get this, it is awarded only to members of the German army who single-handedly destroyed an enemy tank with infantry weapons. And to be clear, anti-tank units are not eligible. That is, you have to be a firm, friendly formation that does not have the mission or is not manned, trained, or equipped to destroy tanks and then actually find a way to destroy a tank, which is a ridiculous criteria to get that award, to get that badge, but body had it. So this guy is just over the top. He's out of this flow. Um, so, <laughs> yeah. Uh, back to the withdrawal. So Bade's role as Commandant of the Straits it's analogous to that of von Liebenstein's, but it included both responsibility for supply flow and the defense of the forces around Strait, which we were just talking about. Body is granted authority over all artillery, anti-aircraft artillery, flak, and naval units in the Via San Giovanni and the Reggio sectors of the mainland. So that's like around uh, Calabria, right? As well as the Messina area on the Sicily side. 
So in modern parlance, we could think of Bade as a, as a joint task force commander, a very small one with a very small battle space. But he's, in effect, a JTF commander controlling the Luftwaffe anti-aircraft batteries, uh, German Navy artillery regiment, and a German Army engineer landing battalion, among others. Notably, he's also put in charge of von Liebenstein. So the sea transport leader reports to the commandant of the straits, which makes sense because the that guy, von Liebenstein, is operating completely within bodies out of space, if that's how we want to describe it. So this gave the operation the unity of command it previously lacked. Body was tireless and he's omnipresent. And Kesselring observed of him that, quote, he seems to have overlooked virtually nothing and to have provided virtually everything, unquote. So reinforced by the flak batteries assigned to him from the Luftwaffe, Bade con concentrated those flak guns, those anti-aircraft guns, on both sides of the straits, and he, assign he assigned zones of fire to each battery, allowing them to mass fires against those Allied aircraft attempting to interdict the transportation. And get this, he's got approximately 500 guns guarding the strait, of which 300 are anti-aircraft guns. And the Allied bomber pilots described the flak over the Messina corridor as the thickest they'd ever seen. Their effect is best summarized by Lieutenant General Adolf Galland of the Luftwaffe's fighter arm, who later observed, quote, the fact that anything at all reached the Italian mainland was solely due to the flak batteries. Their unique concentration protected the continuous ferry traffic so effectively that the hordes of Allied planes of all types could only half complete their mission from a great height. Uh, before I go on to Allied mistakes, uh, Eric, any other uh, thoughts or comments from what we just discussed? No, I think that segues right into that. The, these are all the things that the, um, the uh, German command did remarkably well, but this still could have been thwarted had the... Uh, Allied counter effort been a little more, shall we say, streamlined, coordinated, thought out. So you, you do a good job of sort of discussing as the three or so main shortcomings in the Allied uh, failure to stop this fantastic yeah. withdrawal of troops. Absolutely. So I'll let you just go through them one by one. Sure thing. Yeah, there, there's two sides of this, right? So the Germans were on their A game. And the Allies were not. Despite having superiority in all domains, uh, they, for, for various reasons, could not bring them to bear and optimize their effect. So first, we'll talk Allied naval issues. So while the evacuation routes were protected by some German minesweepers and Italian mini-submarines, the Allies still significantly outmatched Axis naval combat power throughout Husky. Still, there seemed to be little consideration for, or say, a commitment to an Allied naval attack into the strait. So while Royal Navy destroyers occupied the southern end of the strait and the U.S. Naval Task Force occupied the north end, neither went into action into the strait itself. Now, some motor torpedo boats and motor gunboats did make some small thrusts into the strait to engage some of the ferries, but as soon as they made contact with Axis patrols, the, the, the craft turned away, avoiding a fight, and, and they had little choice. Once they were revealed, uh, again, 500 guns were anti-aircraft guns. I'm sorry, 500 guns total, 300 were anti-aircraft, which means 200 were not, which means many of those could be turned on some of those naval small boats attempting to penetrate into the strait. So unless those coastal batteries are suppressed, the Allied navies could offer little in the way of interdicting the evacuation. Now, those Allied naval forces, again, they were overwhelming, and they likely could have accomplished this. But Admiral Davidson, whose Task Force 88 operated off the northern end of Sicily, and whose mission was to support General Patton's 7th Army as he drove across, he wasn't even notified that the Axis evacuation was occurring. And Admiral Andrew Brown Cunningham, commander of the British Mediterranean fleet, uh, uh, covering that south side, he elected not to do so. Now, let's let's pull that thread. Why? So it's surprising uh, if you know Cunningham. This is at odds with the reputation he had of a fiery and aggressive commander who had only months prior led Operation Retribution, which, ironically, was preventing German naval withdrawal from Tunisia. He initiated that operation with perhaps one of the most metal commands ever issued to naval forces, quote, sink, burn, and destroy. Let nothing pass, 
end quote. I mean, I'll tell you what, if I've heard that over the one MC, I want to swing across and board an enemy vessel with a sword and just start packing away. But, um, it's like Gandalf in the mines of Moria. <laughs> yes. Well, this, show, is a, pass. this is a movie moment. We, we, we must see this film. Um, so, so given a spirit like that, it seems surprising that he didn't take the same approach at Messina at the time. So there, there's what he said at the time. And there's what he says later at the time. Cunningham argued that there was no effective method to interdict the evacuation by sea and that the naval guns of his ships would have been ineffective against the Axis batteries guarding the strait. But later in life, he admitted, quote, I wasn't going to be caught in a trap the way we were in the Dardanelles in the last war, end quote. So the scar tissue of the Dardanelles campaign, during which the British naval attempt to force those straits had ended in a staggering defeat, still haunted the judgment of Cunningham. And so consequently, the decided advantage held by the Allies and naval power was not exploited. Um, Eric, anything before I go on to the Air Forces? No, that's that's the perfect thing to transition to at this point, I think. Absolutely. Okay. So, yes, uh, let's talk Allied air power. So neither was Allied air supremacy leveraged to halt the acts of withdrawal. Now, one complicating issue... Um, complicating the matter was the prioritization of available aircraft. So Air Chief Marshal Arthur Tedder, who's the commander of the Mediterranean Air Command, he was expected to not only interdict the Axis evacuation, but also to shape the oncoming invasion of the Italian peninsula. So this greatly diminished the effect he might have had against Axis ferries and ports at Messina and Calabria. Because again, he's looking at the next stage of the war, right? So he's looking at major urban centers, road networks, marshalling areas, the, the typical strategic bombing to do, right? In addition, Major General James Doolittle's Northwest African Strategic Air Force, they may have been able to mass bombing ops at Messina, but uh, like I said before, like most strategic air forces, these were tasked instead to destroy lines of communication on the European continent writ large. So focusing Doolittle's forces on a target as small and as, in his mind tactical as Messina would have been been seen as you know below his remit, at least to do little, and he would have he would have argued that point. But uh, Air Chief Marshal Sir Harry Broadhurst, who commanded the Desert Air Force during Husky, he offered this assessment: "Quote, my feeling at the time was that had we applied the same heavy bomber strength to both sides of the Messina Straits that we did to the enemy airfields, although we might not have prevented the escape of a sizable number of the enemy, we could have turned their success." into a disaster, end quote. So in addition to the Axis observed predictable air operations from the Allies, uh, no Allied aircraft were observed by the Axis an hour after dawn or an hour before nightfall. So once the Germans recognized this pattern, they maximized their throughput of ferries during those, ally, th during those hours. Excuse me. And Allied air operations over the Strait also seemed to be very considerate of midday mealtimes. Uh, leading German Vice Admiral Friedrich Rude, who was the senior naval officer in Italy at the time, to make the remark that, quote, the Anglo-Saxon habit of lunch hour also helped considerably, end quote. Uh, finally, we're going to talk amphibious and runs. Any thoughts on, on the air ops before we go to the amphibious side? Yeah, that last quote kind of, uh, I think, sums it up quite nicely. <laughs> Never be predictable like that. Yes, yeah. I mean, hey, I, I like my chow as much as anybody, but um, that means, uh, you know, you're, we're going to have to fight the enemy again. Yeah, sometimes you got to intermittently long. fast, right? I mean. Yeah, chow is <laughs> continuous, right? Figure it out. Um, okay, so let's finish with some amphibious operations. Des despite not making a serious attempt to apply naval and air power against the strait itself, the Allies did conduct several amphibious end runs intended to land forces behind the retreating Axis forces to trap them. Now, while one of these end runs nearly succeeded in cutting off part of withdrawal, the operations they were largely ineffective, countered by responsive German forces. The only such landing that presented a legitimate threat to the evacuation was that conducted by Lieutenant Colonel Lyle Bernard's reinforced 2nd Battalion of the 30th Infantry Regiment on the evening of 10 to 11 August. So Bernard lands, and he's initially undetected, and he takes the high ground behind the, uh, the German line of withdrawal. 
So they make contact with the enemy, and a heated battle ensues, with Bernard supported by the naval guns of Davidson's Task Force 88. So at this point, Davidson, again, maybe not focusing on, on the withdrawal of the forces, but he is supporting Patton's forces in this very direct fight. But he loses comms Bernard, and having already hit his pre-planned targets, Davidson could not continue to provide support, fire support, for fear of killing American troops. And fearing his ships could do nothing more to serve as targets for the Luftwaffe, just floating there as, as any amphib commander is going to want to do, he wants to get out of there. So he withdraws. So an aggressive German counterattack hits Bernard along with Allied airstrikes that mistake him for the Germans, and it decimates Bernard's troops. The noose is broken, and the Germans slip free of the trap. Additional Allied amphibious end runs, they are ordered by both Patton and Montgomery, but they prove fruitless. At least one of them actually gets outpaced by the advancing Allied forces on Sicily. So when the amphibious troops come ashore, right, you know, we've all been programmed watching Save It Private Ryan. We know the doors are going to go down, you just start getting hit by enemy fire, and, and you're right into the, the jaws of death, right? The amphibious troops, they come ashore, and they see not Germans waiting for them, but Allied troops sitting and relaxing on the ground, enjoying a lovely meal. Perhaps a bit of a dis disappointment, but also a, a great relief for uh, for those landing forces. Uh, before I wrap up and, and talk about the aftermath and the so what, uh, Eric, one last shot, anything about the amphibious ops or anything else we've discussed? No, that's a really good summation of the um, main shortcomings of the Allied response to this um, historically successful evacuation. And um, you, you flesh it out nicely in the article, so I want people that are hearing this or seeing it to... Um, be inspired to go read more about it there. So let's, yeah, let's talk about the aftermath of this, the the um, the great cost of letting them get away and what this means later. Um, and just take it from there. So sure, go ahead. Yeah, um, so just to, to summarize, uh, as we've just hit, the Allies, they seem they're unable to capitalize on the air and able supremacy. Air power isn't mass against vulnerable access targets. Naval task forces never press into the strait, largely due to the, the scarring memory of the Dardanelle campaign and some miscommunication. The amphibious end runs, some showed promise, but they were too little too late, uh, as well as uh, with some lost comms and fratricide uh, botching Bernard's landing. And perhaps most confounding to the Germans was the absence of an attack on Calabria, which would have bottled them up on Sicily. And while that could have proved decisive for Husky, again, that option was ruled out months ago at the Casablanca conference. But the outcome of the campaign, is, it's not just the result of those missed opportunities on the part of the Allies. Axis leadership, as we discussed, is, is just as decisive. Kesslering's foresight, his willingness to order the evacuation before Hitler had approved it, bought critical time. Hubei and Guzzoni, they conduct a disciplined fighting withdrawal that stymied Patton and Montgomery's amphibious enrons. Bade, the commandant of the strait, he brought that much-needed unity of command to the forces involved in defending the strait. And Admiral Barone offered Italian leadership and made other crossing points accessible to the Italian forces speeding along throughput. That's another uh, just scratched on point from the article, but the Italians, they had a big role here as well. I, I just unfortunately didn't dedicate a lot of time to, to studying that. And the reforms of the sea transport leader, von Liebenstein, he might be the most important operational contributor of all, because that enabled the efficient fairing ops that flowed combat power into the strait to facilitate that fighting withdrawal, and then enabled the forces to move across the strait into Calabria. So the success of von Liebenstein's evacuation provided the retreating Germans with a powerful surge in morale. Now, Kesselring's chief of staff, Colonel Bogoslav von Bonin, he summarized the feelings of the drawn forces thusly, from which I draw the, the title of the article, and I'll quote here at length. Quote, we had more than enough retreats, but through the fault of our higher command, they almost never ended gloriously. Every German soldier on Sicily, however, who after weeks of fighting and tremendous effort, reached the mainland in the middle of August with his weapons, artillery, vehicles, and other equipment, could understand what deep truth there is in the term glorious retreat. After five and a half weeks of battle on an island against an enemy who, in ground forces alone, had four times our numbers, who, in supplies and equipment, was still, still superior to us, an enemy who had absolute superiority on sea and in the air, 
the three German divisions on 17 August were again on the mainland, ready and equipped to be committed in battle, end quote. So while there can be debate about a validity of comparing this to, say, a German Dunkirk in terms of the propaganda intent and the effect of communicating the withdrawal as an unexpected victory against overwhelming odds, many of the German sources, they, they do confirm that this is how the Germans perceived it, that even in defeat, they would pulled off something important. And it was a shot morale, shot in the arm for morale. But more than that, this naval operation, it kept those three Axis divisions in the campaign and the Allies are compelled to fight them in a slow, bloody slog up the mountainous Italian peninsula for the rest of the war. So what happens on Italy after that is the Axis, they establish a defensive position, a line across the peninsula. The Allies, they they hit it, they hit it, they hit it, or trade it, trade it, trade it. Once they finally mass enough forces and find a way to break that line, or as the Germans see, they need to fall back, the Germans fight a very disciplined fighting withdrawal to the next line. And again, and again, and again, all the way until the end of the war, due in large part to innovative ferry operations and a disciplined cross-channel evacuation. Eric, over to you. Textbook stuff. Absolute textbook evacuation. And it's probably worth pointing out that that fighting up the spine of Italy was some of the most brutal costly of the entire brutal costly war so it's no small thing that those divisions uh got a way to be part of that and make that that much more uh, of a challenge um there's a lot there um i think that are good lessons for anybody uh in the profession of arms today um it's the axis who provides the lesson in this case but it's also officers who didn't get Hitler's permission. So in a sense, <laughs> remove some of that stigma when you think about it. But um, there's really, a, it's, it's definitely worthy of study. Uh, and it, it also underscores a larger point, doesn't it? That um, a really, really well executed evacuation is every bit as important as uh, defense is as important as offense. And, it, you know, we're, we're so focused on that half of it. I guess it's the more sort of exciting half of it that um, the bread and butter of the whole thing, it has to involve this kind of measured sparing of your troops. And um, they did it against odds too. So that's pretty amazing. Um, yes. Fascinating uh, stuff. And I'm sorry, go ahead, Brian, please. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, I understand uh, we hesitate to, to praise the judgment or performance of, of our enemies and in particular, our access enemies, right? Lots and lots of reasons why. However, when you're looking at this exclusively through the lens of operational art, military planning, military sound, military planning, the lessons here are pure gold. And we, as an American military, we don't aspire to defeat. We don't aspire to withdraw. Um, everything in our planning cycles, right? When we see phases, it's always like it all leads up to you know a decisive operation and then exploiting success and then and we win every time except when we don't, and when we didn't. We do have many uh, operations ourselves in which a withdrawal or a retreat uh, is required. And while that should not be our focus of effort, uh, there's, a, there's a need, a requirement, and we as professionals should be prepared to and have the capability and capacity condu to conduct such an operation if we have to. The lessons are there. In addition, how to decisively exploit an enemy when they are on the run. This shows other lessons, overlooked opportunities, missed opportunities for that coordination to conduct, uh, you know, I, I hesitate to use the new buzzword of multi-domain operations. It's just joint, joint operations. If they're not joint, then instead of massing all your advantages in air, sea, land, etc., cetera, um, you have a disparate effort and the enemy can exploit those gaps. Mm -hmm. Yep, there's much to chew on here. Um, it's a, another um, potent lesson from history's pages for uh, the history that will unfold in our time. Um, but speaking of, uh, uh, and I, I highly recommend this piece, but I, I also would like to point out, and I kind of started with this, that uh, you, Brian, are extremely prolific. Um, you appear, now you've been in naval history, and we're, we're thrilled about that, but you off, often appear in the U.S. Naval Institute proceedings. You're a prolific contributor to that journal and you also write for any number of other things war on the rocks um uh give you name of just name a few others i mean it's a long yeah. list yeah cer certainly uh so 
Naval Institute Proceedings is probably where I've hung my hat the most, and I'm honored to uh, to be a part of that team. Very happy to to have finally broken into to naval history. Uh, I'm I love I love military history, and this has been a goal of mine for a long time. So I'm honored to achieve there. Uh, I've appeared in War on the Rocks before, many times in the Marine Corps Gazette. Uh, now you'll see many more pieces uh, in the new Atlanticist. I've got a couple there and have many more forthcoming, which is uh, a defense publication of the Atlantic Council, which is uh, a think tank. And so my, yeah. my focus of effort there, ironically, is on the Pacific. Um, they've, they've started an Indo-Pacific security mm -hmm. initiative. So the, the, the Atlantic and the Pacific are more intertwined than ever. And I'm uh, a part of that Pacific focus. Signal Magazine, which is a, a, a technical publication of the Armed Forces Communications and Electronics Association, um, and some, some many others to include uh, some small press uh, fiction and, and literary publications as well. That's an impressive output. Now, um, that begs the question of to ask you um, to talk a little about your process. Um, I'll start with the nuts and bolts of it, because uh, writing is a um, wonderful calling, but it's also a demanding one to find time for and um, lives that are busy like yours is. Um, do you have like a set time you write every day or like, do you try to knock out a little bit of something every day? How does that work? How does your process work on that ground level? Great question. So for me, I anchor the scheduled writing with the objective. Um, I wish I was disciplined enough and my schedule was predictable enough that I could say, okay, every day from X hour to Y hour, writing 500 words period full stop i would probably have a much greater output if i was that discipline uh unfortunately or fortunately um however you look at it my life is a little bit more dynamic than that so instead once i set on a target um that's when i set about the writing process so for example if it's i want to write an article for submission to naval history magazine okay let me do my intel preparation of the battlefield, right? Okay, I need to read that magazine. I, I would have chosen it because I've already read it. And I know that that's a suitable audience and a suitable publication for me. I know the submission guidelines. I know I'm writing to say 2000 words or 3000 words or whatever the word limit is. Okay, and I have my subject in mind. I need to do my homework. I do, I'll do the research, the writing. Uh, presumably I've chosen my topic in that publication because I've already got an idea because of other reading I've already done, but then I need to really show the mastery of the field or the work uh, so that if it's, if it's not enabled, if it's a historical article, I can speak cogently to those issues. And if it's something else and I'm offering an assessment or a recommendation, I, I know the other things that have already been written about it, uh, other potential shortfalls and obstacles, counter arguments, et cetera. I then let that marinate. Uh, and what do I mean by that? Uh, so all these things are just in my head and I'll think about it for a long time. Uh, usually like when I'm running, when I'm PTing, whatever. And that's kind of where I do a lot of the heavy lifting of ordering my thoughts. Finally, then I know, all right, I'm going to write. Then I do sit down. Okay. It's the weekend, Saturday and Sunday. I'm going to wake up early. I'm going to write from this hour to that hour. Uh, and then so on for Sunday. Okay, Monday afternoon, I know I have time. Wednesday evening, I have time. And I'll hit, then I'll hit my target of 500 words, 500 words, 500 words, till I've hit my max word count. Then I edit like a mother, right? Kill your darlings, kill your darlings. Um, and you need some space if you're going to do it yourself between yourself and what you just wrote, because you're, you're just too close to it. If you have a trusted agent or a trusted uh, person, partner in crime or a buddy who you know will, in fact, give you critical feedback, let them have a look and they'll see like, hey, I know you really love that deep dive on, you know, bodies, uh, adventures in boarding school, but that doesn't actually support your article. Maybe you cut those three paragraphs and you buy back time for something else. Or maybe you're writing not a historical piece, but an assessment on, let's say, uh, this new formation you want to build in the Navy or the Marine Corps. And then somebody else reading it might be like, that's a great idea. But you're just asking for, what, three more generals and 12 more ships and this and this and this. Do you know how long it takes to make those ships? And do you know how long it takes to produce those personnel? And where are they going to come from if we're not allowed to uh, get more people? So what are you cutting? So you then need to address some of those things. So editing, editing, editing. Finally, just submit to the publication. And then you move on to the next one. Because as you know, 
The, the wheels of publication often move fine but slow, especially depending on the publication. Um, this isn't a, cr a critique of history, but historical publications tend to be a bit more slower in the flash to bang. And that's just the nature of the field. Uh, and when you're writing on things that happened 70 years ago, waiting a bit longer is okay, right? Um, other publications may have a faster uh, response time, but if you just wait on that first one, you'll be waiting a very long time. I say then just move on to the next round, next round, next round. When you get the feedback, I provide the edits, or if I get a rejection, maybe there's another home for that same piece. So one bit of advice I give to folks is this. Um, I've been, at this point, I have almost 90 publication credits. So in the double digits, I have triple digit rejections. And many of those same rejections, I have pivoted to other publications, especially if I'm writing in like naval military issues. There's again, Proceedings, the Marine Corps Gazette, War on the Rocks, the Center for International Maritime Security, depending on your topic, the same thing might fit in all of those publications with some edits, with some shaping. So if say publication X rejects me, that same article might be a really good fit for publication Y because the rejection might not be because Brian, you're a garbage writer. It might be, this is just not a good fit for us at this time, or we can publish it, but we just published an issue on that theme. So it'll be about a year and a half before we would consider this again. So you might want to get your idea out more with more rapidity than that. So you, so you can pivot. So be prepared to pivot. Accept that rejection is part of the game. Um, accept the bruises and the black eyes. You got to have a thick skin for this. And really, the craft of writing demands you write. You're not going to get good. You're not going to to find your tempo or your speed, your 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 voice, name it, until you start writing. So when I first started getting into the game, uh, my rejections far outweighed my acceptances um, tenfold. And a lot of that was just because it'd been so long since I tried to write in this mode. Because, like, uh, you know, I was an undergrad, uh, graduated in 2006. I didn't start trying to write properly until approximately 2015, 2016. So it'd been a while, right? Uh, I had to rebuild those, those skills that had atrophied. Uh, all that to say, just get in the game. Just get in the game. That's the only way you're going to start publishing, the only way you're going to start writing. So I'll pause there. I, I threw a lot at you. No, that's all good stuff. And a really good pillar to post description of the, the process of banging out one piece. Um, and it sounds like you do one with a focus and don't have a couple of them going at the same time. But just because of your level of output, I wonder if like you generally always have something going. Like you finished – that first one, you got it from the tactical steps to the very finish. You paused, you came back and gave it an edit after you cleared your head from it. Are you on to the next one right after that, generally speaking? Because it sounds like you've constantly that. got something you're working on. So I have uh, a running, I call it my my digital whiteboard. It's just a big document full of ideas. It started as one document, and then that turned into many other documents where I've got like the paragraph flushing it out. Uh, and so I already have a whole bunch of ideas uh, on the back burner. Um, and then as soon as I've got one round down range, as soon as I hit submit on one, I move to the next one. And which one I move to may change based off of, uh, hey, it's topical because real world events have made this topical. Sometimes I had an article that I thought, man, this is ready to go. I should, I should write this right now. And then over time, that quickly becomes OBE. But then it's like the cycle continues and then the idea i thought that was overcome by events suddenly becomes very relevant again uh and so then i'll shift that one uh to my next priority other times now and again i i'm at this point now because of the prolific output which has generated opportunities and other connections uh and and working with things you know organizations like the atlantic council it might be like hey brian we know you are the guy on this based off of your background what do you think about writing something like this? And oh, by the way, can you have it done in you know two weeks? So then I'm like, that's an opportunity. I just have to complete that. So then I drop the other writing tasks. I reprioritize that one. And then I pick up the other one uh, as I go. Same thing for uh, the Naval Institute Proceedings. There might have been a, a very pertinent um, naval issue uh, that emerged based off of things that are occurring in the news. And I might, of my own volition, be like, you know what? I'll bet if I submit an article on this topic to this editor, 
it'll probably get digitally published very, very quickly because it's in the news right now. And I make, I take that gambit. I bang out the 2,000, 2,500 words. I'll submit it and I'll be like, hey, uh, I know this typically takes a much longer time to go through the process, but this is hot now. Uh, my recommendation, uh, please consider publishing this digitally, perhaps in print later, but I'd be fine with just a digital publication now because I think this is of value to the readers immediately. And that can, can generate um, some, some good fruit there. But I only develop the ability to have that kind of pull uh, where people bet on me as a known good after establishing my other writing credentials. All that to say, the more you write, the more you get your process down, the greater uh, and more frequency of your input across different areas. Because I don't just write on one thing. I, I write on you know, naval history, uh, naval operations, force design, leadership 101, all sorts of things. Um, but I, I, I would offer, and not to pat myself on the back, that I'm a, a, a known good to the publishers I've worked with. So they're willing to assume more risk when I throw a lot, perhaps a not so wild, but maybe a wild idea at them. Right. Well, you're at the point now where they're beating a path to your door as the uh, occasion uh, warrants. And so it's still the same thing one at a time, but this one you were kind of ramping up on is pushed aside by momentary events. Then you get back to that one, you get back. It's a good system and it's obviously working great. And, um, I'm glad you finally cracked into the pages of naval history and uh, definitely hope you'll do some more uh, work in that field as well, because it's uh, it's an honor to finally have you in the pages of the magazine and it's a great article. And um, well, yeah, thank you so very much. I, I absolutely will. Uh, again, like I like a lot of things about what we do in our field, uh, in our service, but uh, history uh, weighs very heavily in my heart and has a very strong place there. Uh, and I'll absolutely be submitting to Naval History again in the future. Fantastic. Well, in the meantime, folks, read what he's got in there right now. It's uh, really great. And it's been great talking to you today about it, uh, Brian, to sort of flesh out some of the details of it. Um, great discussion. And I appreciate you joining us. And hopefully we'll have you on here again very soon. Thanks, Eric. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. I guess that's it for us today, folks. I'm Eric Mills, Editor-in-Chief of Naval History Magazine. And we will see you again very soon. Take care.